Uh, we have a very special program this morning, so I'd like to uh, launch into a few uh, preliminaries. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody to another roundtable program. And I'd like to start out by having the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As you may know, uh, our programs are recorded uh, live for Zoom. Uh, this morning we had some technical difficulties in that the Zoom mic uh, has gone missing. So for the Zoom audience uh, this morning, uh, the sound quality will be poor to middling. So uh, our excuses for that. Uh, however, if uh, the Zoom audience uh, does uh, can hear well enough, we can still have the uh, chat function whereby you can ask questions uh, and we will uh, attempt to answer them if uh, you can hear well enough. So our apologies for that. And, uh, however, um, the Meeting is still recorded for a broadcast on the library's YouTube channel. So that function will go on as normal. So for that, I'd like to uh, thank Selena Diaz-Alid uh, and Sarah Davies. Thank you very much. And the library for providing that facility for us. And the coffee this morning is again provided by the uh, coffee cart and the model group. So please, uh, if you're so inclined to have coffee, and we do ask for a $3 donation for that. And as I mentioned, we have a very special program this morning uh, in which we are having uh, the mayor of Imperial Beach Paloma Aguirre, who will present an update on the Tijuana sewage problem. So this is a very uh, hot topic uh, in Coronado, as well as Imperial Beach, and broader implications. So uh, we will have our own board member, John Schumann, introduce the mayor. John, can you come forward? It's a pleasure to be able to announce our speaker for today, Paloma Aguirre, Mayor of the City of Imperial Beach. I first met Mayor Aguirre in 2017 when I um, decided to write an op ed that was published in the San Diego Union on the pollution crisis at the border. Um, and subsequent to that, Mayor Aguirre and I both have served on the Citizens Advisory Council for the U.S. IBWC. There's not a person that doesn't have a broader and deeper understanding of this issue than Mayor Aguirre. And we should be very fortunate to have her here with us today. She holds a BA in psychology and also a master's degree in biodiversity, marine biodiversity and conservation from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Please help me in welcome the Mayor of Paloma. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and uh, give you an update on what's going on with the sewage crisis. How many of you are from here from Coronado? Do you have anybody here from Imperial Beach? <laughs> nice to have you both here. So yes, again, my name is Paloma Aguirre. I'm the mayor of the city of Imperial Beach. I've been mayor now since November 2022, so going on a year and a half. 
Prior to that, I was uh, the, one of the last council members elected at large because now the city of Pearl Beach has gone districted. Uh, we have four districts and the districts and the mayors at large. Before that, I became involved in this issue because believe it or not, my goals and aspirations were to become one day a professional surfer. I I first moved to Pearl Beach, well, I first surfed in Pearl Beach in 2001. I wasn't able to afford to live by the beach in 2003. Uh, I just fell in love with this people and its waves. I was loving Pearl Beach. And I didn't know that I had been surfing in polluted water for a number of years. I was raised in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where my mom and grandma were from. And seeing brown water meant, you know, it's rainwater, it's tropical storm runoff, right? It's normal. So one day I saw a man putting up signs on the sand that said, clean water now. Looked really like, oh, what's that? So I approached him and I said, what, what is that? What are you doing? He said, don't you know you serve the most polluted beach in America? No, no. That man, the previous mayor of the city of Pearl Beach and the co-founder of Wild Coast, <clears throat> he said, you know what, you should come and volunteer for us if you're interested in this issue. So the very next Monday, I went to the Wild Coast offices and I became a volunteer and I worked my way through becoming a coordinator, program manager, coastal director. And the more I learned about this issue, the more I realized how incredibly unjust and harming it is to our communities. And I'm going to go into the why, and then I'm going to go into what is being done about it. Um, just briefly want to mention, I did a, a short thing in um, D.C. Uh, when I was going to get my master's at Scripps Institutional Oceanography, I was selected as a 2016 John <clears throat> Canals Fellow to go work in Washington, D.C. on the legislative branch. And just this morning, I had the great pleasure of meeting one of John Knauss's friends. Where is, where are you? There you are. Oh, <laughs> I just thought that is so amazing and wonderful that you got to meet um, the legendary John Knauss. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about what are the impacts of the cross-border pollution um, here in our region. As we all know, this is a decades old uh, issue. It stems from, um, frankly, from our uh, original NAFTA trade agreement that was signed in the 90s, right? We knew that these extra negative externalities, especially around the environment and public health, would happen uh, because we share the watershed with Mexico. It's 1,800 square miles in size. Three quarters of it are in Mexico, one quarter is in the U.S. It's a seasonal river. This river should not run when, there, when there's dry conditions, but when it rains, it has the capacity to flow up to a billion gallons of water per day. And all of that, this is a photo of when the river's flowing. As you can see, the side um, on the Mexican side is entirely channelized. It's, it's a cement bottom, which contributes to the lack of filtration, percolation, accelerates the river's flow, which in, in turn accelerates the flow of pollutants, right? And this is one of the most polluted rivers in America. It is listed for every single pollutant you can imagine because it flows through a heavily urbanized area of the city of Tijuana. The city of Tijuana has now roughly close to 3 million people. They don't have the same resources as we do. It's a fraction of the budget that, for example, the city of San Diego has. So there's insufficient infrastructure for trash collection. There's insufficient infrastructure for stormwater and sewage. And they have a very unique situation where they have a combined stormwater and sewage infrastructure system. So every time it rains, you have these breaks and collapses with pipelines that spew sewage. And you can see on the right-hand side of the photo, the city of Tijuana is on average elevated 300 feet above sea level. So all of that drains down into the main stem of the river through the estuary and out into the ocean. So just sewage has caused us over 820 consecutive days of beach closures. That is the southern end of our beach shoreline. That's from the border wall 
to basically South Sea Coast Drive, which is the last houses that you can see next to the estuary, that's South Sea Coast um, Drive. And then our main stretch of beach starts there and includes the pier uh, all the way to Carnation, which is YMCA Camp Surf. That has been closed every single day this year, every single day last year. For you all here in Coronado, it's been a similar case. My understanding is there's been Pretty much this entire year and most of last year, you've had beach closures. Um, the reason why we've seen an increase in beach closures are twofold. One being that we've had an extraordinary amount of rain events and rainfall. You've heard of the term atmospheric rivers mentioned, right? We've had plenty of those. In fact, we even had a tropical storm last year, which I'll get into. So the, the reason why the river's flowing up much higher rates, so we're seeing a lot more effluent um, coming out into the ocean and it's all sewage deep with water. Um, the other reason, it's, it's kind of ironic because we now have one of the strongest beach water quality monitoring programs in the nation. In fact, the first ever pilot project to transition from a culture-based type of testing. And all that means is that you take a sample of water, you put a couple of droplets in a dish, you let it, um, you know, cultivate overnight, 24 hours, 48 hours, and you can see if it's produced bacteria. Bacteria has replicated rate. That's the old type of testing. The new type of testing, don't ask me specifics because I'm not a scientist, but basically it's DNA based. Right, it's a Q qPCR type of testing that is DNA based and uh, produces results in four to six hours rather than two days. So it's a lot stronger, it's a lot faster, but now it's telling us what we surfers have long suspected that when we get these chlorinated smells in the shoreline, it's kind of a surfactant type of smell. We always suspected that the water was polluted, but they would come take samples, the old type of testing, and it wouldn't produce anything. Well, it turns out because of studies done by Fritz, um, they did a study in the near shoreline and studied the dynamics of the waves breaking and the ocean currents and the wind direction. And basically they find that the pollution wraps itself on the coast, when the currents are going, they can travel fast and bring all of that pollution all the way up to here in Coronado. But because of um, the sun exposure, bacteria dies, but viruses don't. So that's why it wouldn't come up in the petri dish type of fish because the bacteria would already be dead, but that doesn't mean that the viruses are not present, right? So um, that's the difference in that. So that's why we've had an increase in beach closures these last few years. So what have been the impacts to the city of Riverboro Beach? Much like yours, except our, um, our city budget is quite, quite small in comparison and our annual budget is roughly 29 million. Most of our um, income is, is um, very steady. It's property taxes, right? And, and sales tax and transient occupancy taxes. Um, but guess what? <laughs> what is affected when you have your beaches closed? Much like yours, tourism, right? We're both uh, tourist dependent communities. Um, that That is one of the shining, um, you know, benefits that we have to offer all of our visitors are beautiful sandy beaches. And when we have a year, two years, consecutive years of beach closures, well, People want to go to the beach and spend a beautiful day and frolicking in the water. And next time they travel out of state or out of their country with the hard earned money, they're gonna probably go somewhere else, right? So that's why when I, when you hear me speak in the media and to anybody that will hear, it's like, we cannot afford to wait another two to four to 10 years because our economy is gonna be devastating. Um, this I uh, wanted to briefly mention uh, some of the things that Imperial Beach used to um, enjoy were summer events, right? I don't know if you remember, we used to have that Ironman, um, was it a semi-marathon or triathlon that they would run on Silver Strand and come all the way to Coronado and then back to Imperial Beach. That's no longer um, being held in Imperial Beach because we never, they never know when the beach is 
right? In the past, it was kind of hit or miss. Now, those types of events have had to be canceled, as well as surf contests. We used to have the, the, the dog surf contest and a lot of other fun events. None of the events that are related to water have been able to take place. And it's so causing a significant economic impacts. Another area that is severely impacting us is, um, you know, our water um, programs, such as the junior lifeguard. Imperial Beach's lifeguards depend highly on the um, pipeline of future lifeguards that junior guards, um, you know, uh, study to uh, train to become. Now. Um, last year, our program had to be canceled. This year, we're still trying to figure out if we can host it at Silver Strand on the Bay side. But guess what? There's other programs taking place there. There's the Silver Strand Junior Guard program. There's um, recreational activities that are happening there for underserved youth. So it's been quite challenging. Um, now, well, I'll go here first. Last year, uh, as you may recall, we, we suffered the first ever boil water advisory. Um, and actually it impacted uh, the Kays in Thrill Beach in Chula Vista. That followed the tropical storm Hillary that made landfall south from Thrill Beach. Um, it was devastating, it truly was. Why? Because our businesses had to be shut down for four days straight. All of our food and beverage businesses had to be shut down for four days until the investigation was completed. So that meant dozens of thousands of dollars in losses for the restaurants and bars and cafes, um, coffee shops. We didn't experience that even during COVID. That's how severe this impacted uh, our local economy. Um, the other thing is we had reports from residents who lived adjacent to, without them knowing that the sample had tested positive in the location that we were informed as city officials, that radius, about a four block radius close to that sample of water had uh, suffered an outbreak of Shigella and E. coli. Uh, we had um, several different um, residents in Imperial Beach report to us that they had come up, that had to be hospitalized. And uh, one of the women who described her experiences to me mentioned that the nurses would even come in with hazmat suits to um, check on her, right? So obviously we were extremely concerned. We raised the alarm. Um, is it coincidence that the sample, drinking water sample tested was very close to both the ocean water and the estuary? Um, yeah. They have not determined the exact cause, if there was a correlation with the amount of rain, the amount of river flow that had uh, you know, been discharged into the coastal waters, we don't know. But what we do know is that during <laughs> that storm event, there was a flow of 7 billion gallons of water, sewage tainted water, flowing through the estuary and into our coast. So there may be a there there. That's up to the public health officials to determine, right? And um, this is a picture of. Um, one of the storm events that we had that was in combination with the king tides, a very high tide, and um, a strong swell that, that hit the city of Imperial Beach. This is at the end of Seacoast Drive, which is our southernmost um, street that runs parallel to uh, the ocean and has the ocean on the west side and the estuary to the east side of it. And look at all of this polluted water. This is all the standing water. So as other cities or other coastal cities start to perhaps to think about sea level rise adaptation and how their infrastructure for water supply, drinking water, and all of that can become eroded because of salt water intrusion, the city of Imperial Beach is worrying about that and also about the fact that all of this is polluted water, right? This is literally human waste just flowing on the streets. So, 
So in the last year and a half since I've become mayor, we've really ramped up our efforts um, in making sure that we sound all of the possible alarms that exist. Um, you know, the city of Repro Beach did pass a, a, a resolution um, declaring a state of emergency related to the sewage. The city of San Diego has been doing so for many years. Um, last year, uh, led by Chairwoman Vargas, the County Board of Supervisors declared a state of emergency. As you may recall, uh, last October, now that I'm also on the Coastal Commission, I've been um, you know, making sure that new the Coastal Commission, being that this is a one of the largest lack of coastal access in the state, and that is our primary responsibility at the Coastal Commission. I don't think there's any other beach that has had 820 consecutive days of not being able to be accessed. Uh, it also became a priority for the Coastal Commission. And in October of last year, one of the hearings that the Coastal Commission held was in Imperial Beach. And all of the commissioners joined in on a tour of the River Valley, of Juana, uh, of the International Wastewater Treatment Plant, um, and, and saw firsthand how severe this is impacting all of us. So the Coastal Commission sent a letter to Secretary Blinken, who is the Secretary of State, um, Governor Newsom, and President Biden, asking them to declare a state of emergency. The governor did decide um, during that month that the state of emergency parameter wasn't met for the state and in turn asked President Biden to prioritize funding so that we could invest it in the International Wastewater Treatment Plant that's located on our side to fix it and expand its capacity. So we have yet to have a declaration at the federal level. However, President Biden last late last fall did um, issue an official request to Congress to increase uh, the supplemental emergency funding bill to $310 million so that we could fix and expand the treatment plant's capacity. Oh, there it is. So, um, why? So the International Wastewater Treatment Plant that is located in the U.S., San Ysidro on U.S. soil, it's one of the first of its kind. Have you guys all heard of that plant before? Yeah. Okay, so that plant treats daily 100% of sewage from Mexico. It, treat, it has the capacity to treat up to 25 million gallons of sewage per day. It's that it was built at a shared cost. It's funded um, at a shared cost but it's not meeting Clean Water Act standards. <clears throat> it hasn't been since 2019. It's been out of compliance. The commission itself has a new commissioner, Commissioner Mayelen Aquino, who has been doing as much as she can with what the resources she had. But frankly, she inherited a treatment plant that's in shambles, really. It's been underinvested. It has experienced deferred maintenance for the last 10 years. And it's a um, in, in dire need of fixes. And as you may have heard, um, in 2019, there was a USMCA um, renegotiation, right? NAFTA turned into USMCA. And there were $300 million allocated to the plan so that we could bring it from 25 million gallons of sewage per day to 50. So that money was intended to double its capacity. However, last year, it was revealed, thanks to a journalist from the San Diego Union Tribune, that the plant needed at least $150 million worth of repairs. So we went into the red. So that's why this supplemental funding request from President Biden for the $310 million additional are desperately needed. So what we've been working on is advocating so that the IPWC doesn't do it sequentially, right? Fix and then double. We've been advocating to them to do it simultaneously, right? To fix it as uh, on the same uh, in the same vein as you repair it and expand it. 
So that's what they've committed to doing. Um, and I'll come back to this if you want a river diversion. This, this, um, it was last month. No, it's last month. Yes. So last month, uh, we organized a trip. Uh, I called on Mayor McCann from the city of Chula Vista and I called on Mayor Bailey to join me and going to DC to advocate for this additional 310 million request to fix the plan and expand it. And coincidentally, Mayor Bailey had just gone to DC. He had, he had just gotten back like two days before I called him. So he's like, hey, I just went, here's, here, here are my notes, here are who I met with. Let's try and visit these same members of Congress. So council member Duncan, your representative here said, you know what, I can go. So let's all go. And it was really great. It was really great to be able to have a bipartisan delegation because as you know, the Senate right now is led by the Democratic Party and the House is led by the Republican Party. So it's, in my opinion, it was pivotal and critical to have members, local leaders represented from both sides of the aisle meeting with members from both sides of the aisle. So that's exactly what we did. And we had some members from the community join us. Thank you, Laura, there in the back and some residents from Imperial Beach which also was very important to provide the community's perspective in our conversations. Um, we met with uh, House um, Leader Johnson and House Leader uh, Schumer, uh, sorry, Senate Leader Schumer, and a number of different um, you know, members from appropriation committees. And it was very productive. And I can tell you from personal experience, having been going to DC for the last 10 years, advocating for funding, it was night and day. The difference that the, the that I saw in these members of Congress of their understanding, of their willingness to fund the project and willingness to work together, everybody across the board understands how dire the situation it, it is and how important this funding is. Why? Because it affects our military readiness, right? We have the most elite in our nation training here in Coronado, nowhere else. In Congress, there are at least four House members that are former SEALs, including um, Dan, Congressman Dan Crenshaw from Texas, who absolutely have been supporting our efforts and understand the the the, the urgency of, of approving this funding, right? We talked to them about the economic impacts and especially with Chula Vista's Gaylord project being completed next year. It's a four and a half billion dollar investment that will bring very important economic um, benefits regionally, not just to Chula Vista, right? That can be jeopardized by having our beaches closed and not to mention, right, the environmental and public health impacts of our community. So it was a very productive um, <clears throat> uh, delegation trip. And I am, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go here first. I'm very happy to report the good news. It's very exciting. But our $310 million request wasn't completely approved, but today the House voted on $156 million. So that's really good news for us today. It, that bill has been now sent to the Senate. It's expected to be approved. It's not the entire amount that we wanted, but it's half. And that will absolutely guarantee that the, um, the fixes and ex the expansion of the treatment plants aren't delayed anymore. So that means that with this money and the money that we already had, the project is moving forward. Uh, Commissioner Keenan, last Saturday, we held a meeting with Senator um, LaFonza Butler, who is the appointee for um, uh, Senator Feinstein's seat, met with us and um, we had a very long conversation and IBWC already has the request for bids for the construction and expansion of the treatment plant already out. So that should be going to a contractor quite soon in the next couple of months. So that's what I'm, I'm just painting that as an example that there's not going to be any further delays because of this funding. So that's a great, um, great, uh, you know, aspect of this conversation. Now, the other one, is that on the Mexican side, there has been a lot of progress as well. So the 
Punta Bandera Sewage Treatment Plant that you may all have heard on the news is a sewage treatment plant that's six miles south of the border. It treats 100% of sewage from Tijuana. It has not been operational for at least 15 years. It's discharging daily 40 million gallons of sewage. Um, cumul cumulatively, it has I think discharged close to 100 billion gallons of sewage in the last year and a half. So it's a very significant source of pollution for our coast, especially during dry weather months. So when the river isn't flowing and the effluence, well, the effluence always flowing, in the summer months we get these currents flowing south to north. So most of that pollution impacts us in the summer. As EPA has stated through their comprehensive solution analysis of the Tijuana River, Eliminating that source of pollution will bring will reduce our beach closures by basically 100 percent. So this, if all goes well, and they stay on track, and there's no hurdles in the on the way, and there's no funding or um, other things that may come up, we may see our beaches reopen next summer. So I just want to point out. What I would love to see happen here and that has happened in Mexico is that this was one of the top three, if not the highest priority for Governor Marina de Pilar. She actually ran on this during her campaign, talked about it constantly. When I first was elected and she was elected, one of our first meet and greet, this was a conversation we had. Very different to my experience with past governors, where they wouldn't even acknowledge past Baja California governors. We wouldn't even acknowledge there was an issue where this isn't making its way over to across the border, that type of thing, right? So this governor, she's always been very straightforward. She committed to doing this during her administration. The plan to fix this plant was originally to have a private state federal funding um, partnership. And that was running into a lot of red tape and a lot of hurdles. So the governor of Mexico, President, um, sorry, the president of Mexico, President AMLO, said this is being uh, too delayed and uh, we're going to turn the project over to the military. So basically, their equivalent of our Army Corps of Engineers <clears throat> is now the lead of the project and it's being fully funded by federal, Mexican federal funding. They tap into their national reserves. And they're funding the extent, the fixing and extension of this plan. So they have set themselves a date for completion of September 30th of this year, because that's, I believe, the last day of President Amlo's administration. So it's a very ambitious timeline, right? It's hopeful that they'll get it done. Uh, I personally sat there when we went to the grand breaking, next sitting right next to Ambassador Salazar where the governor of Baja committed to us in getting it done by September 30th. Now, we just need to make sure, and that's part of what I've been doing constantly, staying in contact with them and making sure that we get constant um, updates and that they stay on target. Because imagine that if this finally happens and it's done the way they say it's going to be done, it will eliminate significant source of pollution to us. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that's all great news. Um, but it, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the plant is supposed to be able to process something like 19 million to 25 million gallons of sewage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a brand new plant to go into that volume. But I think we we'll also mentioned that there's 40 million gallons of sewage. So, right, if you discharge, this won't be sufficient. So the question is, the the estimated amount of sewage that will be treated is close to 19, but I mentioned 40 million gallons, so there's going to be a deficit. The reason why there's 40 million gallons is because the river is being diverted to Punta Bandera. So as I mentioned earlier, the Tijuana River is a seasonal river. It should not have water when it does not rain. Ironically, I have to get into the weeds, but Tijuana built two sewage treatment plants on the eastern side of their city. They're state of the art. They're literally cleaning water to advanced tertiary. 
which can be used for irrigation, right? They never secured funding to put an entire network of purple pipes so that they can conduct the water for irrigation. So sadly, what they do is they put it back into the river once it's treated. So they, they dump it into the Tijuana Channel at a rate of approximately 18 to 20 million gallons of clean effluent. And it's one of the other areas that we've been advocating for because that's a significant source of potential drinking water for them that they could be, you know, um, recycling. Um, and to us, what are the implications? It creates year-round flow in the river when there shouldn't be. So all of these unregulated development uh, neighborhoods and communities in Tijuana that aren't connected to sewage or other little sewage spills here and there, they all drain into the Tijuana River channel. So it all becomes contaminated again. So that effluent now becomes a vehicle for contamination for us. So there's a pump station right at the border. It's called Pump Station Sila, that when it's turned on and functioning, it diverts all those 18 to 20 million gallons of sewage of sewage contaminated water and sends it over the hill to Punta Bandera. So that's why you have that additional bigger number than what there is estimating to have treated. Now, that pump station, my understanding is going to be expanded and the part of the project that i hadn't i haven't touched on but that's important that i will touch on now is the comprehensive solution assessment that epa um, created to analyze what infrastructure needs exist part of that equation and a very important part of that is diversion and treatment of what's coming through the river so there's three major core components that need to be addressed in this conversation. It's the expansion, well, repair and expansion of the International Wastewater Treatment Plant, repair or replacement, basically, of Punta Bandera. But the third element is the one that we haven't really talked about that I continue to advocate for is the diversion and treatment of these dry weather, lower level flows that are coming through the river. <laughs> That's why I have been calling for the state of emergency because every time I'm asked, why would you call for a state of emergency? It, the Stafford Act states that, you know, X, Y, Z, if you're seeking to, um, uh, you know, waive procurement and bidding processes and environmental review of a project, well, that already happened. Why well, I, I say yes, that already happened for the expansion of the treatment plant, but not for the river diversion aspect of this. So that's one of the next steps that we need to continue to focus and advocating for. But for now, of those three, at least two, are being currently addressed. And I think that's extremely good news because to us, at the end of the day, what does that mean is that by next summer, we may have, and I say this very clearly, may, because you never know what can happen, but we may have our beaches reopen uh, for longer next summer. And some of the public health concerns that we've heard in recent months relating to Bait and transport of pathogens via aerosolized, um, you know, molecules, and some of the hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide that are related to sewage water that can cause nausea, vomiting, headaches, um, you know, other uh, areas of public health that we're not even looking at, right? Like, which is long-term exposure to carcinogenics and toxics and other things like that can be eliminated, right? So that is the <clears throat> that is the hope. And I'll just um, briefly mention that the Air Pollution Control District for the county received a US EPA grant to um, establish or you know place uh, gas odor sensors in key areas. We are, we're actually going to put one at City Hall and one at our Imperial Beach Pier. Because what we've been hearing um, constantly, at least my office has, 
is the odor, right? Is I can't even open my windows, I can't breathe, I need a headache ulcer, I need, you know, have headaches, I have vomiting. I hear that all the time. And I think this is a scientific way of acknowledging at least, yes, there are these types of gases present in the atmosphere that can cause these symptoms. And we're collecting data so that we can further analyze what kind of interventions we can um, have the county public health department do. So with that, I'll pause because I want to make sure that people have an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, we'll uh, we will take a five minute uh, coffee break and then we'll come back for question and answer. Everybody, please take your seats and we'll start the question and answer. I said earlier, you're in charge of getting everybody sued in the back of the room. The first question is going to be from Jim Kelly. Uh, 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 thank you for the uh, presentation. It's very interesting. Oh, Maybe uh, made a mistake uh, putting the uh, new tra uh, training facility seal training facility where they did and do you have any specific data as to how much of their training has been impacted any, any numbers that they had canceled evolution or portions of their training but do you have any data on that? well i don't want to speak to whether they had a if they made a mistake or not uh i know they have a state-of-the-art base right and in Kuro Beach is a military town and we're so interconnected and interdependent with our you know military community that I feel very proud that they have established a billion dollar base that's north of our city, right? Um however the question about them being impacted has been a long-standing question that I don't think they wanted to be very um you know, open about because it is a, a, a um, you know, national security matter, right? You never want to say, oh, yeah, our most nation's most elite are being affected. However, my understanding the congressional delegation, I believe, led by Congressman Peters, did send an official request for information. And this was just in the last few weeks where they acknowledged that it does impact their operation. They didn't go into the specifics or give data on how many of their trainees are becoming or anything like that, but they absolutely acknowledge that it is impacting that uh, training and, 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 and activity. So I think that's just another tool in our advocacy toolbox to raise the alarm and get it to the level that it is. Next question. What, what would it take to get our, our, our Army, Army Corps of Engineers on the project? I think that needs a, a presidential national emergency declaration. That if 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 the president were to use his full extent of or his full executive power to the fullest extent, I think anything is possible. And um, I continue to call for that because, as you all know, this crisis has is decades old, but it's mm -hmm. never been as bad as it is right now with such grave regional implications that go well beyond the cities of the Next question. Hey, Madam Mayor, uh, in response to the question about the steel training, uh, the, the answer I would give, having some experience in that, is that you know, training is inextricably related to, to readiness for any military organization, for any organization. So yes, they're going to be in that. Uh, they try to deal with it, but there's nothing they can do in order to continue the training, they have to have which never stops. They have to continue training in that environment. So that's the reality. Uh, what I would like to ask you is um, your relationship with the, working with Congressman Peter's office. How has that been in terms of his advocacy in that? He has been fantastic. Um, he led this charge alongside, obviously, Congressman Vargas and the rest of the congressional delegation. But he's been front and center on this. For years, but especially this past year, when 
you know, timing is so critical, right? Um, he also commissioned a, and I'll put it up on the slide right now, but he also commissioned a white paper. Uh, so researchers from the School of Public Health from San Diego State University uh, just a few weeks ago published a white paper that compiled, I believe it's over 55 peer-reviewed um, articles and, um, and data points into this white paper presenting it, talking about all of the environmental public health um, implications of all this pollution that we know all of that research is out there, but nobody had ever put it into one single uh, you know, source. And he commissioned that and he and I partnered in, in sharing that with the media, which resulted in a um, publication in The Hill, which is one of the articles that most Congress members read, and also a Wall Street Journal article, which has national uh, you know, coverage, and um, another 60 Minutes uh, report that was broadcast nationally too. So he's, he's been fantastic. Next question, Myra. I'm a retired microbiologist. And about uh, 10 years ago, my dog died from Giardia lamblia, which is a very nasty organism that humans can get. The veterinarian said he got it from fish. I'm wondering why we're not surveying our local veterinarian and finding out what diseases our dogs are picking up. First, I'm very sorry for your loss. I have two dogs and I worry about that all the time. And I think that's a super beneficial suggestion um, because we are partnering with a foundation to begin um, survey on um, folks who have reported illnesses. My colleague on the council, council member Mitch McKay's wife, was walking on the sand and had a cut on her foot and contracted meningitis. So it's it's concerning. Um, so we are partnering with the foundation to conduct uh, public health assessment. And we are gonna make sure that we include that question because it's, it's another type of indicator and it's a very real one. So thank you for that. Next question. Thank you for a very cogent talk on a very vital, emphasizing national issue. It's, it's a 100% federal deal, even though we're impacted by it. Uh, just a straight comment here. $34 trillion is the debt of the United States of America. That's uh, $34,000 billion. Question. And Congress carves about a few hundred million dollars for why don't they just go down there with about three or four billion dollars and take care of it, be done with it, be over it. That's it. <laughs> $156 million is a drop in the bucket, right? Compared to our trillion, I think today was announced the, the spending bill is a trillion dollars. So, next question. Mayor Aguirre, thank you for coming. My name is Laura Wilkinson Sinton. My husband is immunocompromised. I live in the Coronado case. My beach has been closed since February. We are really concerned about the public health impacts. Um, especially because of the aerosolized um, you know, germs and viruses that are coming off. And I understand that the, the original Scripps Oceanography study had them going as far as 10 or 20 miles inland, which could devastate our economy here, as well as you know, our property values would absolutely crater with something like this. Our County Department of Public Health should, in my opinion, should be doing a lot more. They're the ones who control those public health dollars and the public health authorities. And I know that we've asked for economic impact reports and we've asked for health impact reports. Where is our county and should we be calling our county supervisors and asking? But I mean, I guess you can't give an opinion, but I think we should be calling our county supervisors because the health of our pets and the health of ourselves and our loved ones is critically important, as well as our Navy, our Border Patrol, our first responders who have to go in that water. They don't have a choice. So, um, we should be doing more of that. Are there any other levers we can pull from a public health standpoint? Well, and again, I referenced this earlier. My office gets the calls and the emails beyond people who live in a trophy trade, people who reside next to the River Valley, Nestor, like Sunny Cedro, 
I mean, the gamut. We've had cases of meningitis, of uh, MRSA infections, fleshy bacteria, uh, eye infections, ear infections, sinus infections, um, you know, the gamut. So it, it is, I'm extremely concerned about the public health impacts, especially uh, following this white paper that Congress member Peters uh, published. Uh, our local health care clinic, the South Bay Urgent Care, which is owned by doctors Matt and Kimberly Dixon, have uh, reported an increase in gastrointestinal cases, uh, gastrointestinal illnesses, um, following rainfall events. Um, the, the, the challenge is that the public health utilizes a different type of methodology, which is to look at death certificates, to look at hospitalizations, and something they call syndromic surveillance. Um, I think that there's an opportunity for us to partner with the public health <laughs> department to take a deeper look, right? Because if they're not seeing upticks, but we on the ground, even if it's anecdotal, it's real and it's happening, um, how do we bridge that gap. And that's one of the reasons why I'm partnering with this foundation to take a closer look and survey some of these self-reported elements, look at data from local clinics and potentially even veterinarian clinics. Because those of us who live in these disease conditions know that this is not normal. And it's not, it shouldn't be accepted as normal to live next to open sewers. It shouldn't be normal for us to not be able to take a walk on the beach because we feel like we can get meningitis. It should not be normal for us to not be able to open our windows during the hot summer night because we can't breathe because we're breathing in sewage, right? Next question. Thank you, Hush Presentation. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for presentation. Thank you. My name is Harvey. And as I watched you listen to your presentation, I kept hearing we're throwing money, uh, throwing motors, pumps, electricity, everything, energy being used to treat this water. But I've heard nothing about pulling the slabs of concrete up, re establishing a riparian way in the river, let it stay through. All over the world, people are doing this now. They're pulling up the infrastructure that we've made mistakes in building. And now in the Rio several weeks ago, and they're doing the same thing there. They're pulling the pulling the, the, you know, the drainage ditches up, and allowing their riparian ways to come back. This is proven it's proven to work. Um, so no one did, did, did not mention that. That's hundred percent accurate. I think there's a worldwide movement, especially here in the US, to restore riverine systems back to their natural state because they bring a lot of benefits, uh, especially the LA River, I think they're restoring it. The challenge with the Tijuana River is that on our side, it's not natural. It's actually right at the border west. It's entirely in its natural state. The challenge is on the Mexican side. It's entirely cemented and channelized. They have the reason just to protect public safety, right, and flood control. Uh, I, I do believe there's a movement of advocates and environmentalists to try and get to um, a state of restoration, but that's an effort that's being led by Mexican nationals in Mexico. We can make suggestions, of course, but you know, there's not some relation. Next question, Morgan. Mayor Gray, thank you so much for coming today. Great presentation. And thank you for being an advocate for some solutions here. Um, well, in the presentations, it seems like they oftentimes focus uh, multiple organizations on San Diego. Of course, we have the resources, but I often wonder with that Punta Banderas location. Was, it's right near their beach, and, and I'm heartened. I see more and more Mexican citizens advocating for solutions too. But can you tell us a little bit about how it's affecting maybe Rosarito Beach? I don't know if it goes all the way down to Ensenada, but. The Mexican side, it seems like they're getting more aggressive to the citizens, but I mean, think of that Rosarito Beach area. Thank you. So when I was at Wild Coast before my elected official life, um, I managed the Coastal Marine Program, which included the entire Tijuana River watershed, both sides of the port. So I was heavily involved in working groups with the other NGOs in Mexico. With It's called the Clean Beaches Committee, which is a beach management committee for Tijuana and Rosarito. So to your question, absolutely. 
the river pollution and the Punta Bandera pollution can impact as south as Rosario Beach. The challenge is that they, they have a very different beach water quality monitoring program. They only test water samples with the old type of testing twice a year. Um, and, yeah, and you know, I don't mean to like <laughs> criticize them in any way. It, it's 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 where they're at right now. There's been years, I mean, probably decades of work of local NGOs on the Mexican side, like Tijuana Waterkeeper, Tijuana Calidad de Vida, uh, you know, Naturalos. There's a whole bunch of groups that have been working for a long time and advocating for improvements and solutions. They've made headway on the plastic pollution. In fact, they passed a single-use plastic bag ban a couple of years ago, four years ago now. And we've seen a significant reduction in that type of pollution, but on the water quality front, they have a long way to go, despite there being resources available to even put up signs. So it's it's really, it's really a, you know, it's, it's startling when you go to, to the border and you see their side of the beach completely packed and our side of the beach closed in the water, but they, they don't. Next question, question. Yes, uh, Mayor, uh, in the past, uh, there have been manufacturers uh, dumping chemicals in the U.S. in rivers and oceans. Is that also happening in Tijuana? There was um, the past governor, Governor Jaime Bonilla, did an assessment, and he found a number. He was somewhere in the news. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. But he had a list of uh, the top polluters that were dumping uh, discharges and illegal discharges into the river. Um, of relevance to us here, just a couple weeks ago, Senator Steve Padilla, State Senator Steve Padilla, introduced a bill to um, fine um, through their taxes, state corporations operating in Mexico that were contributing to the pollution. So I thought that was it's really good. I'm supporting this bill. Next question, Tom. All right, that was really uh, terrific uh, presentation throughout. I have the impression that uh, there was over $300 million two or even three years ago that was uh, appropriated. Now maybe another $160 million. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it'll come through. Mm -hmm. after that. Is, has that other money been, uh, I thought we were close to uh, 700 or even $800 million total. Is that money, U.S. money, has that been uh, effectively uh, spent? Is it still available? Uh, what's the story on the past one? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's been entirely spent. I think it's been allocated to IBWC, and that's what they're going to be using to start the bidding and procurement process. This additional funding is just to make sure that we don't fall short along the way once the project is up and running as far as the expansion. And now what we have learned last year is repair. So total right now, as long as it passes the Senate, we'll have a total 456 million. The total cost that Commissioner Keenan and others are estimating ranges between 600 and 900 million dollars. Um, I think it's more than that because of inflation, supply chain costs, and other hurdles that you might encounter. Even if we were to say that Kai Bala is the 1.5 billion, that's a drop in the bucket compared to our trillion dollar budget approved this year. So it's there and it's being used. Um, is it enough? Not at this particular moment in time, but at least the supplemental funding was not denied. And that was the decision of the Secretary of State. Has it, has it been passed by both houses? The 156? Yeah. I think the Senate is voting on it today. The House voted on it this morning. I heard on NPR. Next question. Uh, um, Madam Mayor, that was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding trying to get my arms around the numbers. Yeah. The eastern pumps you were talking about are creating something like 18 million gallons of relatively clean water that's being dumped into the Tijuana River that one can make an argument that it's almost financially beneficial to divert that to agriculture, and that sounds like a potential solution. If that were to happen, and if the Bandera could handle whatever it is, 19 to 25 million 
uh, about a million gallons of water. Um, then what, and I wouldn't want to put a lot of money on those bets necessarily, but if those two things were to happen, would the Tijuana River be clean if they were to happen? Because it would unburden the food. Absolutely, there. it would be way cleaner. I don't know if it will be entirely clean because you have a number of smaller sources of renegade sewage flows coming in and other pollutants, but 100%. And there were discussions of sending that treated effluent down to Valle de Guadalupe. Have you heard of Valle de Guadalupe? It's an area east of Ensenada that's like the new wine country of Baja. They've been using up their aquifer uh, groundwater um, to grow grapes. That could potentially be an important source of water supply to them. Um, I don't know what roadblocks it's hit, but it hasn't been um, completed. The other alternative that's been discussed is just those treatment plants are literally across from the river from the Rodriguez Dam, which is also now depleted from water. So there's been some conversations of sending water from here just over the river channel to the Rodriguez Dam. Uh, again, I don't know exactly where that stands, but that's absolutely part of the conversation that we have with our counterparts in Mexico when we meet with them. We're always asking, well, where is this um, at, frankly, because it would result in a significant reduction of pollution for us, but for them, it could contribute to their um, source of drinking water. Next question. One simple question, and then it comes a little bit funny. <laughs> when did the population of Tijuana become 30 million? Well, that was my guesstimate. It might be a little bit less than three million, um, but it's 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 growing. Um, okay. It has one of the lowest unemployment rates in all of Latin America. Okay, I appreciate that they are dealing with the immigration movement that we also are. Now, the second question is: I think I heard you say that the beaches in Tijuana are populated, crowded. Has anyone thought about what is going on in the bodies of those people that they can tolerate this? <laughs> I'm not saying we should tolerate the situation, but this problem is not going to be solved in a short period of time. But can somebody compare and contrast USA bodies and Mexican bodies and see why these people are always going to the doctor? And I cannot believe these people are intentionally going to the beach knowing that they will be sick. I, I don't want to make assumptions of their reasoning or their decision making. What I do know is that they do report illnesses or you know symptoms like rashes like gastrointestinal infections i don't know that they have a place to report that to i will say that in our conversation with the county department of public health this week we did suggest that being a point of data that they might consider when doing an assessment or an analysis because Again, a lot of people may not end up going to the hospital. Some people may go to the local health clinic. Some people may go get treated in Mexico. So there's a point of uh, data point there that we may be missing, being that we are so interconnected and we have, I think the estimate is 100,000 people as a floating community crossing back and forth pretty much um, every year. So. I, I think that's an important data point. I'll just say that. And to the reasoning why people continue to go, it, it's a big city and they may not even know that they have these issues and they may be doing it unknowingly. And, you know, um, that's unfortunate. Next question. Thank you again, Mayor, for such a great talk. Um, I just wanted to bring on one uh, other thing that hasn't been mentioned as a health hazard. And that um, affects um, the lung because these chemicals that are detected, the chemicals that are detected by the older meters are um, sulfur compounds, as you said, some of the same compounds that are chemical smog that have been shown to be lung irritants. I personally have experienced um, 
a large increase in asthma and need for asthma medications. I think we should start collecting data on that as well as the clinics you said that are collecting increased GI cases and things. And I, I think I will um, contact the county administration to talk about that health hazard on um, people with respiratory illnesses. I think um, you know that's that's a very good point. Um, I'm very concerned about those other public health aspects. Um, you know, the standard for sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide exposure, the state standards that exist are for wastewater treatment plant workers. So there are these types of exposures that could be high and acute but short lived. We don't have state standards that assess long term, maybe lower levels of exposure and the impacts on the human body. And that's something that I also raised uh, with some of the representatives from the Air Pollution Control District. And I'm hopeful that they will begin to examine that too. We can uh, we pull up our, our city website because I wanted to show you something. <laughs> so this is our Imperial Beach City website. If you scroll down, you'll see this option, right? Imperial Beach Sewage Emergency. Oh, yeah, why is it not? <laughs> Okay, so you go to imperialbeachca.gov, scroll down, and here you click on Imperial Beach Sewage Emergency. And I created a basically a compilation of every letter that has sent on our behalf by us, by the mayor, by the Coastal Commission. Um, I, I, of, um, of importance, I wanted to point out this. This is the white paper that I keep referencing that Congressman Peters Commission at the end of it. You can go and research your own um, references here. These are all the peer reviewed articles and reports that they compiled here for your use. So, anyway, we'll so wrap it up there. I'm so getting that. How do you can find it on your website? I'm sorry. So, you just go to, um, just go to our website here, imperialbeachca.gov, landing page. Scroll down to Imperial Beach Sewage Emergency. And that's where the compilation of everything we've worked on this last year. So. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>